Hello and welcome to the lecture number three of atomic structure. So today we will continue our discussion on how chronologically the structure of the atom was uncovered. So let's take a look at the late 19th century means much before uh, Niels Bohr first proposed the structure of atom. Uh, scientists were aware of one thing that is the atomic line spectra obtained from several gases. So one of the most common thing was the hydrogen gas atomic line spectra. So what happened is when the hydrogen gas was excited at high temperature or with electric discharge people used to notice sharp line spectra. So the lines appear closely spaced with increasing lambda value. So I'm sure that you are already familiar of such kind of hydrogen atomic spectra. Now the point is, uh, it's, it started to intrigue people that how such spectra originated. So it has to be linked something with the structure of atom. But at that time, it was not possible to understand how these spectral lines appear. But still, people wanted to develop certain kind of numeric, uh, uh, certain kind of uh, empirical relationship uh, between uh, the numbers observed and the frequency or the wavelength recorded. So, for example, this, you must heard about a Balmer series. So, in Balmer, in the year 1885, so you can recognize the year, it is much before William Robinson discovered X-ray. So, at, in the year 1885, he noticed that there is a relationship between the frequency of those emitted lines versus 1 over n square, where n is a positive integer and the relationship is something like this. So the frequency of the emitted spectra would carry a linear relationship with 1 over n square where n is an integer. So you look here already in this empirical relationship the value n uh, means and the role of an integer uh, becoming important in this observation. So this relationship, new, the linear relationship of nu versus 1 over n square is completely empirical, means it was found out by trial and error method. Now, whatever Balmer observed, it was much more generalized by Rydberg in the year 1888. So he gave a much more generalized empirical equation so, but he started with the wave number. So his equation was like that. Nu bar is equal to Rh 1 over n square minus 1 over n2 square. So where n2 is greater than n1. And uh, of course, nu bar is in wave number. And Rh, so you can easily identify, it is called the Rydberg constant. And this the value of the Rydberg constant was deduced completely empirically to match the observed value with this equation. But surprisingly, let me tell you, this Rydberg constant is one of the most accurately known physical constants so far. So you can see the, uh, the effectiveness of such empirical equation. Although nothing physical significance, uh, no scientific the or theoretical uh, details was known at that time about the atom. Yet that Rydberg's formula stands so good uh, uh, till that. So not even in 1888 but still Rydberg went on uh, to propose 
a more general formula to predict the line spectra of other atoms in 1890 later without knowing anything about the atomic structure but from all this discussion one thing uh, is clearly evident that when, whenever we talk about an atomic phenomenon the role of the integers here n1 and n2 are all integers means non-zero positive value positive integers 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so the role of integers become extremely important so the the integers uh, dictate the whatever the atom, spectral phenomena we see from the atoms all right so let's take a look what happened after 1890 so when we take a look at the history it surprises us that although Rydberg's uh, empirical formula was working so good yet without understanding anything about atom even it was discovered much before the discovery of electron so as I told you in my first lecture the JJ Thompson discovered electron in 1897 and after that Thompson proposed the atomic structure as a plum pudding model so I think you already know about what is the plum pudding model in 1900 and four. But then there came Rutherford's famous gold foil experiment, which I already explained to you some time before. So it came at the year, in the year 1911. So the outcome of Rutherford's gold foil experiment was that the plum pudding model proposed by J.J. Thompson was discarded. And at uh, at the end of 1911, people knew two things about the atom. Uh, the number one fact that the atom is neutral, of course, and 99.99% atom is void, empty. And whatever the atomic mass is, or in other words, the 99.99% of the you know atom's mass is situated at a very tiny place and this is positively charged and this and somewhere at the middle of the atom and it is called the nucleus okay a very tiny positive space so after the Rutherford's gold foil experiment and follow following Rutherford's model a lot of questions came up about the atomic structure okay so it is very intriguing that how the electrons are located there was you know there was no satisfactory answer and if it is so then how uh, one can explain those atomic line spectra uh, where uh, the observations were already fit by Wilbur's empirical formula okay so then after 1911 in this front there also happened a mini revolution okay so let's take a look at that two years later in 1913 Rutherford's student Niels Bohr proposed the hypothesis of atomic structure or the theory of atomic structure in 1913 so I guess we are all familiar of Niels Bohr's atomic model to some extent so here once again I would like to emphasize on two things firstly so Niels Bohr suggested that the positively charged nucleus keeping the positively charged nucleus at the center the electrons revolved, uh, revolved the nucleus uh, at a certain orbit okay so up to this much so this model is pretty much classical but once again the problem is if a model becomes classical like this uh, there were questions about the electrodynamics and validity uh, of this kind of classical model but Niels Bohr 
explained that although he borrowed the structure classically, but still there is something special due to which the atomic model is sustained. How? Then he introduced one of the two revolutionary assumptions. So the first assumption was the direct application of Max Planck's quantum theory. So he said that the angular momentum of electron are such that these are integral multiple of h by 2 pi or in other words the angular momentum of electron is quantized in an orbit. So this assumption is purely quantum assumption. And not only that, Niels Bohr also suggested, so that's how he matched the uh, explanation of the Rydberg's line spectra or the hydrogen uh, atomic line spectra is whenever one electron jumps from one orbit to another, means a higher orbit to a lower orbit, the energy released, okay, that means the delta epsilon, the energy released is, is equal to, according to the Einstein's theory, a photon is released, okay. So the photon is nothing but an energy packet is equal to Planck's constant multiplied by the particular frequency of the radiation. So then this equation becomes hc nu bar and this nu bar can be exactly replaced by the Rydberg's constant. So now the beauty of this equation is whatever the calculation proposed by Niels Bohr, independently that equation appeared and it ultimately matched with the Rydberg's empirical formula. So the RH here, this was scientifically validated by Niels Bohr's classical theoretical physics. So here we can see the, in Niels Bohr model, one part is classical, yet one part is quantum. So that's why the Niels Bohr theory is known as a semi-classical model of atomic structure. This is not purely quantum. So what is the advantage of Niels Bohr's theory? The advantages were amazing because for the first time Niels Bohr was able to illustrate how electrons are situated, how protons or nu nucleus is situated in an atom and not only that, the experimental observed phenomena like atomic line spectra were clearly explained. And not only that, uh, the first ionization potential of hydrogen atom, that means minus 13.6 electron volt, that experimental value exactly matched with whatever Niels Bohr predicted theoretically. That means that value also theoretically proved from Niels Bohr's theory. So at, at this point, we are not going into that much details of the Bohr's uh, theoretical treatment. But the, bot but the bottom line is, using quantum mechanical assumptions, Niels Bohr for the first time satisfactorily shed light on the atomic structure. And he could explain many, many things that were mystery up to that time. But of course, Niels Bohr has several and severe drawbacks, like it cannot explain the Zeeman effect, Stark effect, and it cannot explain the finer structure of the line spectra. I guess we have already studied about those, and I'm not going into the details. And why those things failed, means why Niels Bohr's theory failed to explain those effects it is because you can guess from here because Niels Bohr's theory was semi-classical so until and unless the theory is purely quantum we cannot explain every experimental results about atomic structure so we can now give a overview of three major chronological discoveries at that time, including the atomic structure. Okay, so let's take a look 
of the revolutionary things that began in 1900 in a little bit of chronological order. So the first came the quantum theory of light by Max Planck in 1900. So the major outcome is that oscillations of electrons are quantized. That's what we learned. And then 1905, Albert Einstein established and extended the existing quantum theory by saying that not only oscillation but the radiations are also quantized in terms of photons, right? And then few years later in 1930, Niels Bohr saw the structure of atom satisfactorily by assuming that the angular momentum of electron are also quantized. In fact, Niels Bohr successfully applied both the theories of Max Planck and Albert Einstein in elucidating the structure of atoms. So together, taking from 1900 and 1930, due to the three major discoveries, 1900, 1905, and 1930, all these together will all these together then finally shaped up a physics called the quantum physics or the quantum mechanics or the modern mechanics. So this is how from the classical physics, the modern physics gradually shaped up within as little as you can see 13 to 14 years and in recognition each of those scientists was awarded a Nobel Prize. So I have already told you that in 1918, Max Planck was awarded a Nobel Prize. In 1921, Albert Einstein was awarded a Nobel Prize. And in 1922, the <clears throat> very next year, In 1922, the very next year, Niels Bohr was awarded Nobel Prize. So once Nobel Prize uh, were awarded, then there was absolutely no doubt that a new era of physics started. But that is not all. Few more development and both of them were revolutionary yet to happen and in next lecture, I'm going to explain one of the two most exciting things in physics took place several years after the Niels Bohr uh, discovered the atomic structure. So we'll discuss that in the next lecture. Till then, goodbye.